Hey, hey, what's up, guys? It's Jordan with the Laundromat Resource Podcast. I'm pumped you're here today because today, I just can't even say that with a straight face anymore because you guys make fun of me about it so much. But I am pumped today because today I have a super good friend of mine on. His name is Michael Ambrose, and he is awesome. Like, he is one of the coolest guys that you will ever meet. And in fact, he's so cool. He and I have partnered in some stuff together and you'll hear a little bit about it today and hear how maybe you might be able to get involved in what we're doing. But not only am I pumped because he's my friend, but he just brings so much wisdom, so much experience in this business. And I I think you're really going to learn a lot. Uh, He comes at it from uh, the distributor side and the agent broker side, and he's going to talk a lot about... uh, distributor ships and how to work with a good distributor and how to find a good distributor. Uh, but he's also going to share a lot of wisdom that he's gained just from going through uh, a ton of different laundromats, meeting a ton of different laundromat owners, probably some of you guys who are listening right now. Um, if you know him, you know he is just a solid, solid human being and really knows the stuff in this business. So I know you're going to get a ton out of this. I'm really excited for you guys to meet him if you haven't yet and to hear what he has to say because it's awesome. Uh, All right. So number two, the other reason I'm so pumped today, like incredibly pumped. I don't know if you have tried to go on laundromatresource.com over the last like week or so, but it has been a nightmare over there. Uh, The website was off and on. It was glitching out like crazy. Sometimes you couldn't even get on it. It was slow as molasses, even slower than normal, which has been slow, but I am so pumped and genuinely excited to let you know that it is like lightning fast over there now and everything should be good and taken care of. So if you have been on the forums and it's just been too slow, in fact, I got an email from one of you, uh, which was uh, part uh, compliment and part uh, hey, get your act together, which I really appreciated both sides of. Uh, but one of you guys sent me an email that said, hey, your site is the slowest site that I'll go visit. <laughs> and I was like, first of all, thank you for saying that. Second of all, we're getting it fixed and we got it fixed. It's like lightning over there now, uh, super fast. So if nothing else, that should make the forums way, way, way more easy for you to interact and get to know each other. So go check out the forums, laundromatresource.com slash forums over there and go ask a question, answer a question. It'll take a third of the time it used to take you and you'll be really excited. And again, we're just, we keep trying to do a little bit better, a little bit better making it a little bit easier for you guys to connect with each other and to connect with us and what we're doing and also to share wisdom with each other, whether that's, you know, on the podcast, on the forums, uh, in the blogs, on the YouTube, wherever that might be. Uh, we want you guys to connect with each other and connect with the people in this industry that are going to help you succeed and meet your goals, financial freedom or whatever it might be. Uh, so anyways, so pumped, so, so relieved and pumped is so stressful for me, <laughs> uh, having the site down and, and just causing so much trouble. So apologize for any of the inconveniences, but we're back up in lo- online. So go over to laundromatresource.com. Check out what we got going on. We got webinars every single week. They're free on Thursdays. You can sign up at laundromatresource.com. Go check out the forums, everything else we have going on over there. It's awesome. And we got a lot more in store uh, coming up. Super excited. Okay. Uh, The other thing I want to mention is this gets alluded to kind of throughout uh, the the podcast episode, and we don't really go into it until the end. So I just wanted to uh, briefly just fill you in on what we're talking about. I'm not sure if it was clear or not, but I just want to make sure it is clear. Uh, So Michael and I and Ross Dodds, who's a former guest of the podcast, have started a syndication group uh, called Diligence Capital Investments. And we are um, partnering with investors who want to be a little bit more passive in uh, their laundromat investment, or um, who may want to ease their way into laundromats. And uh, so we've put together the syndication uh, in order to buy some laundromats and or real estate together. And we talk about this at the very end and how you can get involved, but check out diligencecapitalinvestments.com. Link is in the description on YouTube, the show notes. That link, every other link of everything we're talking about, including the forums, everything that gets mentioned in the podcast episode, they will all be at laundromatresource.com slash show 46. Uh, So check those out there. 
Without further ado, and without any other interruptions, let's get into it with Michael Ambrose, a good buddy of mine, a distributor, and just a solid, solid human being. You're going to love it. Let's check it out. Michael, what is up, man? I am so excited for you to finally, finally come on the podcast. Thanks for coming on, man. How you doing? I am so excited to be here. I've seen like maybe 45 or 50 people before me, and I'm finally <laughs> glad that I was able to make my succession in this line. Uh, and um, I'm really, really excited to be here as well. Yeah. Had, uh, I like what you're doing. Um, the platform that you've created is uh, helping people. You've had some incredible people on. I've watched a bunch of your podcasts, not all of them, honestly. And, uh, cause I don't have the time, but, uh, <laughs> let's talk about who you hate and haven't watched their episodes. Let's name them by name. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, there is no one, everyone you have on is very, it's very educational. Um, and it, it's something that I've, I've uh, actually, I'll wake up early in the morning and I'll work out. Right. And I'll have your podcast on while I'm listening on speakers in the garage. Yeah. And I'll listen to that and think that it's, uh, that's how, that's where I make the time to do stuff like that. And when I'm driving too, Yeah. but, um, I'm learning a lot and I'm learning a lot. I've been in the business for quite some time and, um, I can only imagine, uh, how everybody else, what they're getting out of it. So, uh, thank you for doing such a great job in the industry. I really appreciate what you're doing. I personally enjoy what you're doing as well. I appreciate that. And I can't think of anything that would pump somebody up more to work out in the morning than the podcast. I just, I can't think right? of music. Jordan Berry yeah, podcast no. <laughs> and all of that. Like I'm uh, pumped, right? Yeah. I mean, laundromat Can podcast. Can you please say it for me? I'm is, yeah. pumped. Oh, I am pumped, dude. So <laughs> there you pumped. go. But I want to hear super pumped. Uh, I, I, well, you'll hear, you'll have to listen to the intro because I haven't recorded okay. it yet. And I might just be mega pumped. I don't know, man. I just have enough. to see where can't it goes. Uh, well, hey, man. Uh, you know, I cannot say enough good things about you. So I really am pumped that you're here uh, on the show. And I want, I know that you have a ton of things to share with people that are really going to help them out, help them either get into their first uh, business or to optimize, you know, their laundromat business, or maybe even to scale their laundromat business. Those are kind of the three main things that, that I'm trying to focus on over here to help people, you know, buy laundromat, optimize a laundromat and scale their laundromat business. So, um, dude, before we get into any of this vast knowledge and wisdom that you have, because you have been in the in the industry for a while now and in a few different roles. Before we get into that, why don't you tell me a little bit about you? Who is Michael Ambrose? Well, first and foremost, I, I think I'm the best at being a father. Everything else after that, I just work really hard at. <laughs> um, <laughs> you are a good dad too. Yes. Background is, um, background is I, I was born and raised in Yuma, Arizona. And I wow. um, went to school in Tucson. I was there for general business at University of Arizona. And then um, I did this careers project. You know when you do this careers project, or actually, you know when you take an elective, right? Uh -huh. You always do the easiest elective so you can keep your GPA up. Right, right, right. right? So I do this, uh, it's this careers project. And it should take, it's everyone in the class probably took an hour and a half and aced it. I sat there for two days and I was like, what in the heck do I want to do with my life? General mm -hmm. business? Where mm -hmm. am I going with that? And then so I took some time and I figured out I like to travel because I'm from Yuma. So I wanted to get out there and just see things. And um, and uh, I didn't really care if I made a ton of money, but I wanted Swift and you don't have to, you know, I didn't, I wanted to travel and have fun. And the hotel industry was very sexy to me at that time. So I pretty much packed my bags, left the University of Arizona, went to UNLV and uh, finished hotel administration school. So uh, after I did that, I um, boosted my career in the uh, hotel business with, I uh, worked for Hyatt Hotels. And I started off in Monterey. I was in their management training program. I was in uh, Monterey and then moved out to Atlanta and then I was in Knoxville, Chicago. And then I ended up way back out here. So at first I was wow. operations manager as assistant <laughs> levels, director of housekeeping, front office manager there along. When I was in Atlanta, I had this, uh, this rooms executive and she was just like, I think we've got this great opportunity for you. I think, and you, we've all heard that before in our uh, life. Yeah. Famous last words there. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> and then I was like, no way. I'm not going to laundry. I am going to be the youngest general manager in this organization. 
mine the last I was 23, right? Uh-huh. And at 23, we all think we're going to conquer the world, right? Totally. Yeah. So, so, um, so she basically took me by the ear. I said, no, thank you. She said, yes, please. And grabbed me by the ear, drove me in the office, threw out all the files and said, here's your new job. You're the new laundry manager, right? That was 1999. I've been doing laundry ever since. <laughs> So then it was uh, Knoxville, Chicago, back out here. I worked for a chemical company after my uh, stint with uh, resorts and hotels for about 10 and a half years. So that was pretty cool because it was back of the house operations. I was selling chemicals, but then it was an easier sale because I had been in those positions and I knew like the... I knew the the times that a director of housekeeping goes through, a laundry manager. So I wasn't this salesperson trying to sell them chemicals. I had been in their shoes at 800 room hotels. So it was a nice little niche. Um, so I was there for about 10 and a half years. And then I got this job with the distributorship here in Southern California. And so I've come full circle from operations to chemicals consulting. Now I sell equipment. And then eventually that evolutionized into real estate. So it's uh, it's come full circle. You have been and here. I am all over, well, and here you are at the pinnacle, probably of your whole life. I would say, you know, on the I podcast. Hope not. I hope come, not. I hope there's more. Where to do you where, where do you have to go? You in me? Jeez. Where do you oh have to gosh. go from here? This is like the pinnacle of life to come on this <laughs> podcast. You're about to be a laundromat superstar. I mean, where is there left to go? Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Maybe you got plenty left in the tank and there's plenty higher to get. But uh, um, one of the things I love, I mean, thank you for that background on who you are and where you came from. I think that I didn't know a lot of that stuff actually. And so I think that gives a lot didn't. of context. No, I didn't. Um, but one of the things that really intrigues me about you is you are Laundromat Mike. Oh my gosh. <laughs> can, can you tell me a little bit about Laundromat Mike? Who is Laundromat Mike and, and what are you all about? Well, let's see. So I I go into, so in sales, I go into laundromats all day long, mm-hmm. all day long, resorts, hotels, and so forth. So I get to see behind every closed door what nobody else gets to see. You know, in regards to the laundromats, um, many owners, they go out and they'll see their competition or when they're looking to buy their store, they'll go out and check out 10 places or 15 places, or they're really aggressive guys will go out there and see 20 places. And so, so uh, I was walking out of a place one day and I'm like, you know what, this is, I'm blessed to be able to go in and hear all of the voices and see all of the places, look at all the successes, learn from the failures, learn from the successes. I'm talking to people who have one store, talking to people who have no stores, who want a store, who've been searching for five years. I'm mm-hmm. talking to people who have 10 stores. Um, so it it resonated to like, well, you know, I'm not more of a social media guy, but I've become one to some extent because why not covet all of this that I'm seeing? Why don't I just bring it out there? And so in Laundromat Mike, it's uh, trying to put a little spin on it, trying to make it personal. Basically, it's the life of a guy who sells laundry equipment for a living, who travels around and tries to show you, you know, the professional side of the business, things that are great, things that aren't working great, things that I see are really sexy because I've, there's one thing that we're going to get through this whole podcast, Jordan, laundry is sexy. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so if I can bring that into the homes and if I can show someone a bulkhead that was just recently done or a store that was recently done or the before and after shots of, of, of a retool, if that can get into someone's home and they can say, you know, I like that design out there in Southern California, I'm going to apply that out here, or I'm going to apply that with my own little version. And that makes their laundromat great. Then my job is done. It's pretty cool. So I have the ability to do that. Yeah. What I love about that is, I mean, that's pretty similar to like what I'm trying to do too, right? It's like, we're just trying to take people behind the scenes and help them learn the best ways to to get in this business and the best ways to run this business when you're in. And uh, I mean, I love, you know, and oh, we should mention that the the medium that you're posting this stuff on is on Instagram, right? Yes. Laundromat Mike. It's on Facebook too. And Facebook? 
It's I'm going to link, Facebook. I'm going to link to those. You guys need to go follow laundromat Mike on Instagram and on Facebook. I don't think I follow you on Facebook, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll go follow you on Facebook too. I definitely follow you on Instagram and I always love seeing your posts. So go follow laundromat Mike on, on Instagram too. I'll put a link in the description if you're on YouTube or in the show notes, uh, if you're listening on the podcast. Thank you, Jordan. Yeah. So what's what, I mean, have you gotten any feedback about laundromat Mike? Are you, are you interacting with people because of it? I'm assuming you are. It's pretty cool. It's, it's, it's been great. It's been something like coming out of a shell, like on this podcast, I'm, yeah, it's been tougher to sit here and talk to, uh, I think what, like 3 billion people um, are watching your podcast <laughs> least, right now. At least. Yeah. I thought it was like, you know, 20,000. And then when you told me 3 billion, I yeah. got a little nervous, Yeah, you, but yeah. Um, it, it's actually, third of the world. Really? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I felt like we were going, I felt like at the Super Bowl. All of a sudden, yeah. like, <laughs> so I talked to people and I messaged with people all over the country and, and um, some out of the country, which has been pretty cool to see people see, see things resonate within people and they actually reach out to you. Um, so it, it's very difficult to give opinions when I'm in Southern California and this market here is on steroids mm-hmm. um, talking to someone and, you know, uh, Florida or somewhere in Alabama or anywhere else, because everything changes every quarter of a mile in LA. Um, demographics change, people change, competition change. And that's one of the things that I thrive on in this business. I love it. Um, you, you wake up every day and nothing's the same every single day. You have the goals and the visions of what we know, the fundamentals of this business that everybody can focus on. And then outside the fundamentals, and different markets, things change. Um, so I, I really enjoy that about um, this business. I was recently back in um, North Carolina at the Wash House, the Williford family. You, um, Oh, Luke Williford, who will eventually own every laundromat in the world, I'm convinced. But yes. He, their family is incredible. <laughs> Luke and I, you're I awesome. went back out there with a partner of mine and um, it, was, it was eye-opening. Um, by the way, Luke was a top 10, just to let you know. I think I'm 70, yeah. 45th, yeah. maybe. You're 46 is what you're going to be in. Yeah. There I go. There's a silver lining. I thought it was 70. No, you're good. Um, you're you're definitely top 50. So, so but Luke, I'll link, but, speaking of Luke, though, I'll link to his podcast episode. It's amazing. You got to listen to it if you haven't. But go ahead, continue. I watched it before I went out there to meet the family, and uh, it, it was impressive. Um, back to saying that, you know, the difference in ways change demographically. I went back there and um, they own 37 launch rats in North Carolina. Um, it was an eye opener because everything out there was different. Demographics were different. Layouts of the facilities were different. The stores were different. We actually had room where in Southern California, everything's <laughs> packed in like how tight we can pack this in and, you know, have five foot in between the aisles. Well, right? I remember, Post speaking of laundromat, Mike, you posted something on uh, on your Instagram of behind his dryers and how much room there was. And I didn't really realize at first that it was actually behind his dryers because there's like you could probably fit three rows of dryers behind the dryer. Like there was so much room back there, it was crazy. So I got some comments that are like, "Oh, why are you doing that? You can't do that up there." Well, they can do it back there. And the thing with that building, well, there was a little thing they. They were, there was a, the building was an awkward shape. Mm-hmm. So in order to make everything square in the building, that side of the building behind the dryers was a little bit larger than usual, yeah. but point in case is there was room and it's important to have access. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but so, so it was back there and, um, the layout, the rents are different. The labor is different. The competition is different. Um, and then you go to, uh, and then here in Southern California, um, like I said, LA is like a market on steroids. Um, I live in Ventura County and Ventura County has, you know, you have um, San Fernando Valley is still LA County, which is um, pretty heavily dense. But in Ventura County, you have like Santa Maria and then Oxnard, which are the heavily dense areas with laundromats. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's uh, so, so Santa Maria is in uh, Santa Barbara County. And then you get up into Slow County and it's like a blast from the past. There's nothing going on in slow yeah. area like LA, Oxnard, um, Santa Maria. It's just completely different. So going back to the, I've been able to talk to people all around the country and people have 
um, liked the personal touch and liked the business touch. And every once in a while, I make fun of people in a very lighthearted way, um, just to drive a point in to don't do this in your laundromat. Um, but it, it's been nice hearing from everybody around and uh, being able to go around and see that this is a very, very, very unique business. And uh, many times as a distributor, people ask me a lot of questions. How much is this store going to make? Well, you know, I've got 20 <laughs> questions for you to answer that question. Do you know the answer to those 20 questions? <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that, I mean, that leads us right into, I mean, you are a distributor and you have been for a little while now. And I, I mean, I think I talk to people all the time about, you know, the importance of having a good distributor. I did not have a good distributor getting in. Uh, people have been hearing me whine about that for a while now. Uh, but, um, there's another dig. We met a few years ago, right? And you bought nothing from me. Yeah. Like, I don't even think I got a follow-up call. Thanks for driving all the way down here to LA <laughs> uh, and, uh, spending bro. your time. Um, like, but, but it's okay. We'll talk about that here. Bro, at that point in my question. life, I was bewildered. I had no idea what I was doing and I was just trying to stop the bleeding. So I apologize. Uh, but obviously I couldn't help you at that point <laughs> here, but here's, you know, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on. That was but, about five years ago. That was when my first year in the business we met. Yeah. And you had yeah, that, that uh, laundromat, which I still think you have, right? I do. Yeah. So that was, that was an, an experience. The music and the, the, everything going on around your laundromat was, <laughs> was, was, was entertaining. And believe me as a distributor and as a salesperson, it's all about telling people's stories, right? Yeah. And so your laundromat, believe yeah. it or not, for that quick little stint that we met, had a lasting impression. Yeah. Well, on, uh, probably more noggin. the car wash across the street called the wet spot was probably the thing <laughs> you remembered more. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. Yeah. No, that's yeah. It, that's gone now, but that was uh that definitely brought a little flavor to our little neck of the woods over there. It was um, definitely a lot of added enhanced flavor for that neighborhood. Yeah. But I do plan on making it up to you and some, and we'll talk about this a little bit at the end, but uh, you know, you and I have partnered with Ross Dodds, who have also have been on the podcast. And if you haven't listened to his story, you've got to listen to his story. And I'll link to that too. Um, he's got a crazy entry, but you know, we're going out now and we're syndicating laundromat deals and real estate deals, and we're going to be buying equipment. I'm sure, you know, we'll probably, probably use you as our distributor. I'm guessing maybe. Don't grind me. Don't grind me. <laughs> Well, I want to get into that. Okay. So let's talk about that. What is, what a, is distributor? a distributor? Right. Because I'm telling people you got to have a good relationship with the distributor. Right. But let's talk about what a distributor is. And then I want to get into how do you best work with the distributor and how do you find a good one? What is a good one supposed to be doing? All those questions. So let's talk about what is a distributor. So um, this was one of the questions that you gave me that you were going to ask me. Um, uh -huh. you ha I don't think you've had a distributor on yet, have you? I don't think I have now. See, top 10 all Dude, of a sudden. Number so one, lying. number right? one distributor. Right? <laughs> I love it. That's right. Um, so I prepared a little bit. So it's a business that works for a specific manufacturer and distributes their product. Okay. Um, and there's and, and a distributor does that for all brands, for all different things from payment systems to equipment to uh, vending machines, all of the above. Um, so the sales reps are responsible for the direction of the sales, sales path of the product. Um, each path is different based on customer's experience and needs. So they provide information on the product and competitive products, information on the industry. They supply demographics and give their opinions on demographics. Um, they work with you on the surrounding competition. Um, if you go into a situation where you need to re-equip the store, it would be there to look at the demographics surrounding competition and help you discover your new equipment mix, um, your washer and dryer ratios. Um, they'll give you their, uh, their, their experience from previous experiences based on the demographics and competition. They help you order and receive. Um, they're a guide in the project. They're not doing the project physically, but they're associated with everybody who's working on your and their goals. Um, 
assistance in any obstacles. Jeez. Um, have you had any obstacles in the development of your businesses? No, not at all. No, no. it's been I want to work with you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> yeah, no, tons of obstacles all along the way. Wish I had somebody like you to help me through them. Well, it happens no matter who you have. It's just the nature of the beast, nature of the business. And when you're doing big projects, whether it's 50000 or $650,000, things come up because you got so many other people involved. Um, so, so sales reps that work for distributors help with the guidance of the project. And they're there for you as an expert to help guide the process to its concluding days, which is grand opening. Mm -hmm. um, so they assist you with stuff like that. And then also, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting when, when you're re-equipping a store and going in and you get this opportunity to make it better, to do different things. And you look at everything around you, um, you're able to help with the psyche of the consumer. Um, there's being all the kinds stores, of different things. Being the, the, the psyche of the, the store owner or the psyche of the customer of the laundromat or both? The end, the end user. Mm -hmm. um, where do people go when they walk into a place? Um, what do you want to see? What impression do you want to give them? Um, right when they immediately walk into a store, um, out of order, you know, it's funny how this isn't all the time, but a majority of times you'll walk into a laundromat and if there's a top pocket that's out of order and a, a stack dryer, the five around it, like nobody wants to touch it. Like, get me away. Mm -hmm. It's out of order. It's sick. It has the big Rona virus, you know, just, yeah. <laughs> right? there's something wrong with that dryer. And, and, and it's like guilty by association because the other five dryers are sitting around and going, use me, use We're me. Good, yeah. <laughs> and, and you can't. So stuff like that. And then walking into a place and, you know, uh, the big machines in the front, you like a lot of people want to see big machines when they walk in, because the first impression is, wow, this place I can wash for my whole entire family in one load or whatever mm -hmm. it may be, but stuff like that. They help you with the psyche. They help you with the installation. Um, they'll either have an installation team, know of an installation team or guide your installation team through the project. Um, and then, you know, they help maximize the performance of the equipment. Uh, there's a lot of networking systems out there that uh, allow you to maximize the performance of your equipment. There's a lot of, uh, different things out there that you can do during installation to give your equipment ease and for the next 20 plus years, be able to perform well. So they help you with that stuff too. Um, they're supposed to follow up on results. So, so uh, that is part of uh, the job description of a sales rep and uh, good sales reps follow up and build a partnership because, um, we should be doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and then continuing the relationship with the customer. Um, you should be there before, during, and after, and after, after. Whether, Jordan, you're buying one store or not, I should be checking up with you, making sure everything's good, and let you know I still care. And uh, hope one day that you uh, purchase another store or you sell your store so I can help you sell it. But you keep the relationship going <laughs> in a good, forthright, and honest way. Um, that's it. Well, thank you for kind of, I mean, that's a thorough breakdown of what a distributor is. And I think that's awesome because I think a lot of people don't really understand. I know I didn't understand what a distributor was. I thought, yeah, I go to a distributor because they're the gateway to equipment and in you are right as a distributor, you are kind of the gateway to equipment, but you should be a lot, you know, all these other things that you described, you know, and for me, you know, and you'll hear people, uh, something like the top, these top owners, top operators, the ones who've been on the podcast, or maybe see them in, you know, the forum um, or Facebook groups or whatever. Um, people, you know, top operators say, Hey, have a good working relationship with a distributor, a good distributor who's really going to take care of you because they're going to end up making you money and you'll make them money and it'll be a great, you know, relationship. And nobody, nobody told me that. And the, you know, the distributors that I have worked with in the past are great people, but they didn't do most of these things that you just listed off. And now here I am, I'm partnered with you and with Ross and, and we're going out looking for pretty big laundromat deals now. Right. And 
we're partnering with investors nationwide to go out and buy a bunch of laundromats and real estate. And guess who's not going to be making any money off of that? The distributors that I've worked with in the past, because they were not these things that you're, you know, that you're talking about. Um, you know, and so just good human practice is doing these things. Good sales practice is doing these things that you talked about. Um, and good business practice is doing these things that you talked about. So, so that's what, you know, that's what I should be looking for in a good distributor, right? I, I believe so. And I try to do all of those points effectively. I can land probably 90% of them, but um, <laughs> we are, <laughs> we are human. We do totally. get busy. Things happen. But yes, that's what you want in a distributor. You want someone to carry you along the way. And, and it's, it's, it's interesting because so this whole stigma of a salesperson, it's like, I can't tell you how many times that I'll walk into a place and it's like, I'm walking through or I'm walking into a wall of ice because it's called an icebreaker for a reason, right? You, you, I have to burn my way through this ice because right when I immediately walk in, they're like, sales guy, <laughs> sales guy. And then, so you have to, you have to develop the relationship early and the partnership early. You have to get to know them. Um, what is their background and experience in a distributor plays a big role. If you, Jordan, and I, we just met for the first time and you were new and I've been where I am now. Um, it would be a path that we would go through that would help you along more than if I was new. Um, I'd have a lot more stories a lot more uh let's say projects under my belt that would help us move forward and 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 then through all of that i've made a bunch of mistakes that's how you get to be better in everyday job it's called being human mm -hmm. so so if you get an experienced person you're stoked but if you get a new person it's darn well just as good sometimes mm -hmm. um when i was brand new um it's so funny so ross right Ross, we know Ross. We know um, Ross. He was the first person that I did a deal with. And I was new and he was new. And I was just glad that he um, he allowed me <laughs> to move with him through his first big project, that laundromat that burned down. It re was rebuilt. Oh, spoiler um, alert. Spoiler if you haven't listened uh, oh, to yeah, this. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go listen to it. <laughs> so so um, it was... So, so he took a chance at someone who he saw that wanted to learn, um, had some fire in the belly, was transparent about, I'm just in this business. I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do all the research I can to make this happen for us. So he, he went out on a limb and took me and here six years later, um, we're got a company that we've got together. And then on the side, like, I, I, I mean, I went to him with North Carolina last week and, um, and then uh, he's got five laundromats now and he's sold one. And I've been a part of all of those transactions. Well, not all of them. He's, he's gone through a, a couple of different distributors early on. Um, but, um, but I've been a part of that whole thing. And that's taking a chance with someone who has a bunch of knowledge or taking a chance with someone who's new. Um, they both can serve you well but you just have to get to know them, ask questions, be transparent, be kind. Um, it's funny when I went into the industry, there's a lot of uh, the stigma of the salesperson. When I went into the industry, there was a lot of older guys who've been doing it for like 20, 25 years. I was like, why are y'all so crotchety? Why are y'all so mean? Why aren't you, did you, you know anything about customer service? <laughs> right? And, and then six years later, I'm like, ah, wow, people can be brutal. Yeah. Like, like everyone thinks that salespeople are, you know, salespeople, but the general public can be just as brutal on salespeople that um, many times, you know, it forms the salesperson to be a little bit non customer service oriented. Um, well, can you, can you tell us a little bit more like from the distributor side of about that? Because I think that's important to understand that side of it for, uh, you know, for how to work with, well with a distributor, right? We need to understand what you guys go through as salespeople. Um, you know, can you take us through maybe like from that initial conversation and through, you know, your sales path a little bit and what that's like for you as a distributor? Um, as far as how, uh, like what a distributor looks for in, a, in, in an individual? No, 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 just, or no, just like get along with a, uh, a sales, how to make the best partnership with a distributor. 
Well, I, I just want you to talk a little bit about, I mean, you said like, it can be like, people can be brutal like to you. Right. So what do you mean by that? I guess. Okay. Okay. So a lot of times it's just the initial conversation. It's like walking into the room all happy and you're excited to be there and you, you want to make some money. You want to help people. You want to take on this new project, which is going to be different than the last 300 you had. And you're going to lose something from this project. And you immediately walk in and it's like, speak to the hand, right. you know, you, you have to break the ice. Um, so you, you have to break the ice. You have to get to know them. Um, I think you can just feel that they automatically think that you're not trustworthy a lot of times. Um, so I generally take the time to get to know them a bit. And that's the salesperson's job. Um, it's not the customer's job, the consumer's job to, to try and get to know the salesperson. Many times in my belief, I think it takes two parties, but I try and get to know their long and short-term goals so I can help them with you know their future. Um, uh, how and why they got into the business, um, a little bit about their family. Uh, laundromat industry is a personal business. Mm-hmm. And it's okay to know about people and not be so corporate in this personal business that we're doing. So, you know, a lot of times you got to break the ice, but then after that, people get to know and see each other a bit. Um, the trust and the credibility gets starts to formulate. Then, um, then bam, there it is. Um, so, so that's, that's the goal is just to get to know each other, know each other's experience and know each other's direction and goals. Um, and then availability. I mean, uh, the customer should always be like, okay, does he answer his phone? Is he responsive? Mm-hmm. Um, is, is he following up with what he said or she said? Um, those are, those are big, big things. Um, follow up is, is key to a good sales rep that works for a distributorship. Um, it's, it's funny though. I was, I was talking about how, how it can, it can be pretty tough. I've had a, um, a few circumstances where, you know, you jump through hoops, you're on fire, you invest all your time, but hours of time. And then they like ghost you or do you like, seriously, I kid you not. I spent so much time with this, these wonderful people. Like I, I, I kind of got personal. I, I kind of had a little heart for them, you know, and I thought the deal was going to go through and it was a couple store deal. And, and I like, I went to their house. I traveled afar to see this place, which was completely out of my jurisdiction. Right. And I got excited. And that's sometimes what, you know, it's the passion that you want your distributor to have. And then when it all came down to it, they were price driven. And I got one of these. Uh, we've decided to go elsewhere, <laughs> like on a text. I was like, text breakup. Oh, I got a text breakup. <laughs> I'll never forget that. I still oh. think about it all the time. It's like, uh, um, and then I've called back several times. I've emailed and nothing, nothing, nothing. but, uh, but it's okay. And um, it's, it's fine. And I would, the moment that they call me up to do business, I'm going to be just as excited as I, um, I was upset that they didn't call me and tell me no, because right. we can take the answer. No, you know, a lot of times in life, you win by default. Um, I'll win by default. You go with someone else and they don't do a good job and you come back to me because of a price. Now, you know why you know, I had a great product and I brought value to the table. Um, so, so that's, that's one of those things at the end of the day, just be honest with your time and their time. Um, and remember the best gift that you can give someone is what, Jordan time, man. Yeah. So, so, (laughs) but there's the other side too. Well, yeah. And well, before we get to the other side, I mean, I I think it's a good point for us as owners to keep in mind that, I mean, it's, it's like a real estate agent, right? Like you don't get paid unless, you know, unless you make a sale. So if you're investing all this time, energy, effort, that's time you could be spending on something else. And, you know, if, you break up with a distributor who's been pouring a lot into you, a lot of time, energy, effort into you and you break up over text and then ghost them from there. Like they get nothing out of that. Right. That's, so that's tough. I mean, it's not, it's not something to base your business decisions off of. Um, but, uh, you said something that was kind of interesting to me and I, um, there's actually, Dave Menz has a really good YouTube video and all, if you don't know Dave Menz, laundromat millionaire. That's the distributor guy, right? He, he, he says, get good relationship with your distributor, right? 
Yeah. He says, have a good relationship with your distributor. And he has a video that he says price versus value. And you mentioned that they were price driven and not value driven, which I think is the implication of what you were going for there. And I'll link to that video too, because it's a really good one. Um, but uh, price price is a significant factor, obviously, you know, when you're investing money in a business, but it's not the only factor. So there, there's more to factor into that. And I would argue as somebody who was price driven in my first retool uh, and, and got the best price that I could. And, uh, but that's all I got, right? Like as soon as those machines were in, I did not see at my distributor again, I didn't get any help from them and I needed it. Right. Cause I was struggling after, even after my retool. So, uh, yeah. So I just wanted to point that out that, you know, price is a huge factor, but it's not the only factor. So, but tell us about the flip side. I mean, uh, I know you, I'm sure you have plenty of horror stories about, you know, customers who's, you know, who've given you the shaft. People still say that. Is the it shaft. cool to say that? No, it's probably not cool to say I that think, anymore. I think it's more of a beer conversation with your buddies conversation, like when yeah. you say the shaft. Okay. You got right. that shaft. Yeah. But okay. <laughs> anyways, uh, so tell me about the flip side of that. Are there some good, you know, stories that you have? Go back to the other side real quick. Uh-huh. So um, the true colors of someone always shows up in certain times. And um, I, I would say, I said, I've won by default quite a few times. Like I'll lose a deal and then they'll go out there and then they'll come back like a year later and be like, Hey, you know, I really appreciate you following up for the last year. And like, you just suck it up and you're like, Oh yeah, I can lose. And this person was great. And I want to do business with them down the road. And you put it to the side and you carry on. Like, I don't know if a lot of other salespeople do that. I'll continue to follow up if I lose a deal. And um, just if I see something in someone that I, I I want to work with them, I will continue to do so. And, and so uh, it's, it's, it's an industry where you, you have to be able to forgive and not take things personally. Um, and you don't ever know what people are going through. So, or, or what other factors were considered in that no to you or that yes to you. So you just, I mean, at the end of the day, you just got to shake it off and um, know that you would, you, you, you will do business with them again because that's what we do. And there's a few times that I've had that come back to me. And right now I've got some amazing partners that I work with that were because of that story. So you just never say no, be tenacious and, and don't take anything personal. And when they come back, just do a better job. So you, they never go anywhere else again. Yeah. And I like that attitude. It kind of puts it back on you, right? Like you can't control what other people do. You can only control your own thing. And I, I kind of have this funny thing that, uh, you know, if somebody like forgets my name or something, you know, I I said, Hey, don't feel bad about forgetting my name. Like no big deal. It just means I didn't do anything memorable enough for you to remember my name. Right. Like that's on me, not on you for not remembering my name. Right. But it's kind of a similar concept, right. Where you're like, okay, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to take it up a level, you know, if, if they come back around and you know, it's on me, they, they make their own decisions, but all you can control is you and what you do. So I like that. Absolutely. Attitude. Get knocked down get back up and be better. Right. Yeah. And yeah. take accountability for, obviously I didn't do a good enough job to get their business, whether it was price or whether it was whatever reason it was, whatever. Yeah. You, you, you take that back the next time and you just do better. Yeah. And, and you know what, I can't wait till they come back and I'm going to knock it out of the park. That's right. That's right. Um, the other side, though, I mean, is uh, people are cool. People are great. People are nice. People are kind. Um, not saying that what we were just talking about, they're not. It's just we we're talking about how oh, sales is tough and you come across a lot of people mm-hmm. and you give your time and your effort. So so uh, I've got a customer that uh, I, I swear I poured in probably more time than um then the last scenario I was telling you about. And at the end of the deal, I walked away with uh, absolutely zero. And this guy was just like, man, we've done a lot of business together. You've helped me out a lot. And then um, I don't know if I, I don't know if I should say this, but he delivered a kegerator to my house. <laughs> That's so awesome. I was like, what is this about? He's just like, you put in a lot of work. You did a lot of time. I see what you did. You didn't get anything out of it. I know you like IPAs. 
here's a kegerator. <laughs> That's so awesome. <laughs> That's so, so awesome. So, and then my, my best story is, and this has only happened once and will probably only happen once in my lifetime. Um, I was, I did another great partner that I have. It started off as business and now we're just friends and know each other's family and everything like that. He comes up to me one day, he's like, Michael, how are you doing on this deal? What? What do you mean? How am I doing? We're doing a great job. That's how we're doing. How did it become me instead of us? Right. And he's just like, are you getting paid? All right. I'm like looking at him. Like, I have no idea where he's going with this. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. And then he goes, I just want you to know that we've done a lot of work together and I see how what we've done together, you're going to, you've just helped us make money for the next 20 plus years. And I know that you get a one-time commission. I just want to make sure that when you walk away from this deal, that you're happy and can't wait to work, do business with us again. I'm like, I'm not going to, the deal doesn't end. We've got a forever deal when you have like that. Like, like, well, who does that? And when does that happen? And, and that's kind of how they run their whole life, which is really cool. And they are, um, uh, super successful at what they do. And they're a, it's great to work with them. So, well, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, you know, are they like that because they're super successful and people would say that, right. But there's probably a pretty good argument that says, no, they're super successful because they're like that, right? Like they take care of the people and they see it as they see the value in what you're doing and they view it as a partnership, right? And they appreciate that, you know, not just in word, but also in deed. And that's, I, I would say that's, that's pretty key to success. In my view. I've told that story quite a bit because it's a remarkable story and nobody has ever been like, yeah, I have the same story. <laughs> so, so I think I found one in a million human being who, uh, totally. who, who has that approach and that approach isn't with me. It's the way he approaches everything, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. Okay. So, I mean, thank you for walking us through that too. And like, you know, how to, how to think about your relationship with your distributor, how to work with the distributor. Um, I think it's super valuable, you know, like you've been saying, like, you know, some of these other top operators are saying like, it's really important to, you know, have a good relationship with your distributor. Um, but we've never really, at least on this podcast, never really broken down. What does that mean? How do you, how do you even have a good relationship with your broker? And how do you know if you're working with a good broker or not? Right. And you broke down those two things beautifully, but I got a question for you uh, because you've been in this game for a little while. And as far as I know, unless something's happened in the last few days, you don't own a laundromat yourself. So what's the deal, dude? (laughs) Why does everybody ask me that? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you're laundromat Mike, man. You got to get a laundromat here. Well, and aside from, you know, here's the thing, like, I know we're going out, we're putting together deals right now for, you know, our syndication and and stuff like that. So I know that, but I'm just curious, are you planning on getting any yourself? Well, let's just say that I've had a few curveballs thrown at me over the years and, um, and I'm getting close. It's been on my mind since day one. And um, I actually had a little deal just fall out in a close by uh, area, which is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, yes, it's going to happen. I can't wait for it to happen. It's got to be the right deal, the right location, the right lease, the right, uh, the store. Like right now I can't take on a 3,500 square foot store and manage it and do, you know, my job the best that I can and do the real estate side. I need something a little bit smaller and that's kind of hard to find. That's within 30 minutes with a good lease in an area that I can manage from afar. So uh, the time is close, I hope. And that's one thing I would love, I mean, just for everybody to understand that you gotta have patience in this job or not in this job, but in this in this field. Mm-hmm. If you're looking for a laundromat, sometimes it takes two or three years or whatever it may be. And uh, the other day I was talking about, so my CPA um, is started in laundry, then became my CPA. Now it's been a couple of years that we've known each other. He called me the other day. He's like, Michael, I still don't have a laundromat. We do all this business. We talk all the time. And I'm like, Shaq, let me tell you, 
there's got to be the right laundromat for you. You have family, you have a job, you have all kinds of things going on. I'm not going to just find you any laundromat. I'm going to find you a laundromat that you can have life balance Mm -hmm. and still make some money. However money that is, I don't know because how much time do you have to give as oftentimes directs how much money you're going to make mm-hmm. um, to some degree, unless you have someone to manage that for you. And if you have someone to manage that for you, that cuts the profit. So anyways, it, it, it takes time to find the right place for you. And I would never just jump into something like I've been around six years looking for a laundromat. Most of those years I haven't been able to do so, but now I'm able to do so. And I'll spend another two finding the right laundromat if that's what it takes to do something that accustoms my lifestyle and allows me to be effective at jobs number one and number two. Mm-hmm. And then um, and no, jobs number one and number two and number three. Jobs one is be a good dad. Jobs two is distributorship. And job three is the real estate. So mm-hmm. um, they have to... Six, they, they, it's a sequential order and uh, I'm not going to lose all or take away from the other two and not be successful for job number four. Yeah. I like that. And I like, I mean, kind of what you're saying is you got to find the laundromat that fits your situation, right? Whether it's you, your CPA, somebody listening right now, who's maybe looking to buy a laundromat, you know, you, not all laundromats fit you know, where you're at in life, either location or business model wise, or um, even, even, I mean, there's so many variables, right? Condition of the story. Like there's so many different variables that you need to find the right fit for your goal, right? And you're going to buy a different laundromat. If your goal is to, is to retire from your, you know, from the rat race, from your nine to five job, you know, you're probably going to buy a different laundromat than you would if you had excess cash and you wanted to, you know, just make some cash flow on the side, you know, and and if that's the case for you, then you probably just want to invest with us. Right. I don't know. Uh, (laughs) um, Yeah. But were you, were you placed into the laundromat that balanced that, that was accustomed to your life or were you placed into a laundromat? No, I was placed into a laundromat for sure. Okay. So that was, I was sold into a laundromat. Yeah. That's nine out of 10 people from my experience, maybe eight out of 10. Um, but so, so that's why you're here though, which is the coolest thing ever without that experience, there would be no laundromat resource. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. you're here for a reason. And sometimes a lot of the crossroads that we face in life, which are, uh, the trials and tribulations of life, Mark rocket us into other aspects of our life that benefit other people, which is the beautiful thing about this. Yeah. Okay. I'm done making fun of you for not having a laundromat yet. I just needed to get a little you jab fun of me. Jab in there. And oh, I was. You just didn't know it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, one of the things, one of the reasons I was really excited. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to be honest that I've been really excited to have you on on the podcast. But one of the big reasons that I've been really excited to have you on is because I know you're laundromat Mike, right? Like you're in all these laundromats, you are talking to all these different owners and you're seeing, uh, you're seeing what works, what doesn't work, what are successful owners doing versus owners that are struggling more. And I'm, I'm curious if you would just give us a little, maybe even as your, as your secret sauce, maybe give us a little bit of what you're seeing, what, what are successful owners doing consistently that, you know, maybe struggling owners aren't doing. Great question. Um, there's quite a few things and, and and you're right. I get to see it. And years later, there's our consistencies with people who have done with, I can take the 10 most successful laundromat owners that I know And each one of the things that I'm about to say, it's consistent within all of them. Mm. Um, Maybe some are uh, stronger at other areas than others, but they're, they're, they're all doing it. Um, One of the biggest thing is just focus on the fundamentals. Um, That's something that the Williford family does really well in North Carolina. They just keep everything so simple and you know why they have to, it's because they have 37 37 laundromats. laundromats. Yeah. (laughs) You can't make it complex and have 37 and manage them effectively. Um, I, Ross and I spent uh, uh, a day with uh, Lee and Luke, and I swear those guys answered their phone maybe three times. Yeah. And spent yeah. 10 minutes on the phone out of an entire day that Ross and I were with them. And um, that just shows that a couple of things that they're effective owners. Mm-hmm. And um, 
Um, they've got everything aligned and organized correctly. And um, it shows that they're keeping it simple and focusing on the fundamentals. Um, so clean, bright, and safe. Everybody always hears clean, bright, and safe. Um, a good friend of mine has always says, you know, would I want my wife, my grandma, and my kids to go there at nine o'clock at night? If the answer is yes, it's clean, bright, and safe, and you're comfortable having your family go there in the evening. So if it's not that way, try and do the best you can to make people comfortable. People want to go where they're welcome, where people know their names. Um, people want to go where um, they feel safe. Um, so focus on the fundamentals and keep it simple. Um, you want to treat your place like you want others to treat it and they will do so. Um, my first year in working for this distributor, I, uh, I evaluated over 400 laundromats in Southern California. Um, have them in a book, a binder, just, just I evaluated 400 laundromats. And one of the things that I saw is I could go into some of the roughest areas in Southern California and I could walk into a really nice place and everybody keeps it nice. Mm -hmm. I can go into the bathroom of a really rough area in Southern California and the ownerships takes pride in keeping everything immaculate. I walk into that bathroom and um, it's pristine. There's no writing on the wall. There's no junk. There's no trash. Everybody's throwing the trash in the basket. Um, and going the opposite direction, I could walk into a place because I cover uh, Santa Barbara County too. Mm -hmm. um, so I could walk into a, like a place in Santa Barbara. I'm just pulling that out of my head because everybody knows Santa Barbara is absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> I could go oh, in a laundromat in Santa Barbara. So yeah. Right. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I know. I, I could I could go into a laundromat in Santa Barbara where the owner doesn't see any of the things that I was just talking about. And what what, what what's going on there? There's writing on the walls, there's spray paints, there's etchings in the uh, in the mirror. You know, the owner's not even turning the water on in the restroom, <laughs> right? Because they don't want people to trash it, take baths, take showers. Mm -hmm. So how you manage that, um, uh, treat your place like you want others to treat it and they will do so. Um, is that a hundred percent of the time? No, but don't let those few people who don't do it ruin it for everybody. It's kind of like the dog that, uh, that, uh, poops in the park. And you, <laughs> this is kind of a crazy, but, but like, I remember going to dog parks all the time. Right. And then all of a sudden you couldn't go to dog parks because there's three people who go there every day, three times a day that don't pick up after their dog, right? You can't kill the dog park because there's three people that abuse the, the, the policy. Terrible example. However, that's the first thing that it's popped in my mind. That terrible because I have had not dogs, but humans do that in my laundromat. <laughs> so it's a relevant example. <laughs> so what are you going to do? Just, just quit your laundromat because right. someone pooped on the floor? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you, you know, you, you, but it is difficult. Like I will say like, you are absolutely right, but especially early on. And, and I would say the key to that, like to, you know, if you take over a laundromat, that's like that, or if you let your laundromat go and it gets like that to where people are abusing it, basically, I will say, and I'll say this from experience that it takes a long time of concerted effort to turn that tide, right? You have to stay on top of things. You have to, you know, be quick to fix things, be quick to clean up things. Um, and even if you've let things go for a little while, it is salvageable, right? But you have to make that mental shift that you're going to be on top of things. Um, and, you know, when I've had <clears throat> problems with um, like homeless people or things like that, it's the times where I've just been busy or I've been tired or whatever, and I haven't stayed on top of it. Right. Um, but if you stay on top of those issues, that's when you can jump into this category where you're taking care of your place, you're treating it the way you want others to treat it. Right. And that message does come through. So when you've been consistent with that and assertive and making sure that you're, you're, you're doing what we're talking about, mm -hmm. um, how do things change for your customers? Um, do, do more people come in? Do more kids sure. come in? For sure. Um, yeah. How, how's that work? Yeah. That, yeah. That's exactly. And people notice, right? People notice um, pretty, pretty quickly when, when the owner decides or a new owner comes in or whatever, 
decides that you're going to take care of your store and that you're going to, uh, you know, cause the neighborhood talks, right. And they, you know, they're not dumb. They see when there's homeless people hanging out and they don't want to be there. Like going back to the clean, bright, safe, that whole safety thing, even if, you know, even if somebody's just kind of dingy and just hanging out um, and they're not really a threat to anybody, you know, people still don't feel safe there. Right. And so, you know, as soon as you're on top of that and uh, people, people know that you care. I mean, first of all, it shows people that you care about their community and their laundromat. Um, As soon as they know that you care, then not only will they come back and start bringing kids and stuff, but they'll also kind of rally to your aid. Right. And I've seen that a lot where, you know, customers will, uh, will, will throw people out of the laundromat you know, if I'm not there and they're there and, and somebody like customers will throw them out themselves because, you know, we've been able to that's create their, that's, a space. That's their place. Yeah. Yeah. And they want to keep it that way. So you're right. Do you have, have you ever had someone thank you? Oh my, yeah. Oh man. Well, and to be honest, it wasn't too difficult to get that thinking coming from where it was originally. Like it was, it was so bad, dude. <laughs> it was so bad, but yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And how cool is that? That just gives you like, okay, I'm doing this. And um, yeah. that, that that's really cool. When you have your customers come and thank you for giving them security, a place to come and do their clothes, yeah. all of the above. So, so but my next, my next thing is um, with successful laundromat owners and the consistency that I see is there's, owners that truly enjoy serving their communities. Um, it's, it's, it's evident. It's true. It's there. The people that care most about their communities who have a laundromat, they actually excel. <laughs> it's how, how that works. I don't know. Uh, but, it, but it does. Um, you know, I, I have, there's, there's a, a couple in LA um, and what they'll do is all day Saturday, they'll prepare um a meal they're like it's i mean in this laundromat's like seven thousand square foot in la and they'll prepare a meal have all the fixings good ends and the all this all the spreads and every sunday it's like this community barbecue or it's not a barbecue everything's prepared so it's this community brunch and um th- this laundromat i wouldn't say it was in distress because of its location it's always going to do good i would imagine but this owner came in and he just said hey i want to take care of the community i want to serve people i want to make people happy i want to make sure that they come to a place where they feel welcomed and the place is booming Mm -hmm. um not because of the brunch but because of the heart behind the owner who is serving the community and that's one thing that's consistent i mean there's owners who come in on a hot day and they'll hand out waters with their kids. Um, There's owners that will come in and go to the party city and then get a bunch of helium and go in there and, you know, do balloons for the kids throughout the weekend. You have kids, right? I do. How cool is a balloon to a kid? (laughs) It's about the same as it is to me. Super cool. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Um, So, Diving into the community, showing that you personally care um, is one of the consistencies. Um, so another thing is, is uh, price leaders. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had a customer the other day call me, talk to me about pricing. I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, what, what do you think I should do? I'm like, well, tell me. I, once again, it's one of those questions where I have, yeah. it's a question and I answer it with 10 more questions. Right. But he had told me he hadn't raised his prices in eight years. And I'm like, Tell me what's happened economically in the last eight years. Let's talk about all the hardships. Let's talk about all the changes. Let's talk about all the natural disasters. Let's mm-hmm. talk about the virus. You know, there's a whole list of things. All of that has escalated the cost of living in my area. I mean, a two by four is what, uh, three or four or five times that what it used to be six, eight months ago, mm-hmm. a two by four. So um, everything's, Everything's cost more than it did eight years ago. So raise your prices. So price leaders are not afraid to raise their pricing and they do it accordingly um, to what they're doing. Um, There's another consistency within these people. These people actually 
aren't afraid to raise their prices, but they also coincidentally, they all keep their places clean and reinvest back into the business. Mm -hmm. So I would question yourself if you're actually, you know, looking to raise prices and do my customers deserve a price price increase? Now, do they deserve it based on, do they deserve to pay more or do they deserve a quarter or 50 cents more based on what you're supplying them? If you can answer right. yes, then increase it and you're not going to lose the right pe- the wrong people. Mm-hmm. Um, if at all, you're going to probably maybe lose a person or two, just as all about that. And, you know, that's uh, sad, but, you know, keep your place, reinvest in it. Don't be afraid to raise prices. And then warrant the price increase, not by not doing anything, not by letting everything go ragged, not by security, not by hearing thank yous from your customers, raise your prices because you're doing the right thing for your people and it warrants the price increase. Um, But don't be afraid. Oh, uh, another thing is, uh, (laughs) this is, I'm sure you'll have fun with this one. (laughs) Keep good records. Most of the (laughs) successful laundromat owners that I know all have immaculate records. But the myth is, it's like, oh, yeah, it's a cash business. You can do anything you want. Yeah, you can do anything you want until you try and sell a business that you haven't been recording on. Mm -hmm. Good luck finding that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, that makes it hard for the broker and it makes it shady. And it's it's not good. So keep good records. I mean, it's all about being straightforward, honest, forthright and uh, doing the right thing. Um, This is a business which allows people to um, manipulate numbers. So um, with that being said, all of the owners that I know are consistent in the record keeping. Well, and I think a lot of what, one of the things I like about this business is the people who are doing well in this business, who are running the business correctly and doing it well, don't, don't need to have shady accounting Right. You know, practices, right? Like you just don't, you don't need to, because one, you're making money and two, you're, you're benefiting from your business is, you know, increasing in value because, you know, they're based on how much money you're making. Right. So if you're making more money, it's going to be more valuable and they're getting tax breaks because they're running their business smartly by retooling or, you know, whatever the case may be, um, running expenses through the business, but they're getting tax advantages or building equity and they're making income. And so they don't need to have shady practices. Write-offs, tax advantages, depreciable assets, Mm -hmm. good records, strong sell, strong business. It all aligns together. When someone spends more time thinking about how they're not going to, how they're going to cheat the system, they they spend more time doing that than making money. Mm -hmm. And then that whole attitude many times is what I've seen. It's not true in all circumstances, but I, what I've seen is that person ends up not doing so well in other parts of their business. Whereas the person who's record treatment, he's focused on the customer. He's focused on a clean, keeping it clean, bright, and safe. Mm-hmm. He's not worrying about if his numbers are going to mash out or not when he goes to sell his store. And you know what? When he goes to sell a store, he's going to sell it for a lot more because there's no BS. <laughs> so it's, yeah. keep good records. Well, That's one it. of the things oh, we had Andrew Cunningham on, and uh, I know you know Andrew too. He's awesome. And people love that episode for good reason. But one of the things he talks about is... Uh, you know, first of all, you should be keeping good records from day one. Um, And, uh, and number two is, you know, when you don't keep good records or you keep two sets of books or you tell the IRS one thing and you tell a potential buyer another thing, those kinds of things, those all erode trust, right? And eroded trust decreases value. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, and, and it slows things down all, all, all the negative things when you're trying to sell your laundromat, um, you know, when you, when you don't have good records or you have <clears throat> two sets of records or inaccurate records, <laughs> all those things. You see that all in all your consulting. Oh, I see it all the time, you know, well, both from the buyer side and, and the seller side. And, you know, it can be tricky if, you know, if a seller has not kept good records and maybe they're not even being shady, they just, you know, have a transaction right now where, you know, they're just not super savvy. The sellers just aren't super savvy business people. And they had, uh, they didn't even have like a, they had a handwritten piece of paper that said, here's what we made in January. Here's what we made in February. And that was, it It was just a handwritten one line, didn't break it down or anything. And it was like, okay, well, 
man, that makes things really difficult to know what's going on with this business, right? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. But you're right. There are a lot of people out there who they, they just don't keep good records, yeah. and it's not because they don't want to. It's just because they're busy with it's supplemental income, so their heads in 15 different directions and so yeah. forth. And 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 they're making money, right? right. They're yeah. making money, and then if you're making money, then why keep records? I'm making money. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. just hard to bring credibility to that if you're trying to sell a place. Totally. Um, another thing is uh, just have to stay in ahead of the competition. You have mm. to do what they're doing better and then some. Um, mm. So I, I continue to invest in the business in the interest of the customers and the competition. Um, your, your investment should be done accordingly to your customers and to the competition. Yeah. Well, uh, can you, can you talk a little bit of more about that? Like staying ahead. I mean, I think that's huge. Like do what your competition is, is, uh, you know, you gotta do what your competition is doing, but better. And, you know, and then some, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Like, what do you, what are you seeing? Um, a lot of times when people are just making money, they spend it in other places they, they shouldn't. And when you invest in the competition, um, you're able to bring more value to the customer. So forget about your jacuzzi tubs, your nice rooms and going out to eat seven nights a week. Um, Wait, jacuzzi invest... tub in the laundromat? Cause that would be awesome actually. I mean, that, that would probably be filthy. Jacuzzi tub in the laundromat? No, your jacuzzi, cu- good jacuzzi tubs at home. Like you're making <laughs> money. So you just go and spend it on all kinds of other things. All right, all right, all right. That was good. That was yeah. good. You're messing with me. I like nah. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you want to bring more value to the customer and, okay. and, you know, invest in the kids' interests, the parents' interests. Can you do two birds with one stone theory? Can I get my laundry done and get some work done? Can I get my laundry done and enjoy time reading to my kids? Can I get my laundry done and enjoy some peace and quiet mm-hmm. while my kids are in the kids' corner? Um, I have a customer in uh, Santa Maria, the same guy who said, hey, uh, are you making enough of money on this? So he's got like this, it's like a 7,000 square foot laundry now, right now. And, um, and he's in a very competitive market. When he first got out, I was like, why are you doing this? Like, there's like 30 laundromats within a mile from you. You've got, this is impressive. I want to see how this yeah. works out. I mean, <laughs> these guys are just awesome, right? It's probably why, you know, there's so this example of the way they carry themselves. Mm-hmm. So um, they've got this. It's it's like better than a McDonald's or a Chick Fil A playground inside their um, laundromat. Yes. And the beautiful thing about it is, it's the two birds one stone. Can I get my laundry done, have my kids play, and not hear screaming kids? So there's there's three birds one stone. And so, um, excuse me, we have a trash guy going by. Um, <laughs> Can't hear him. You're good. So um, so at this laundromat, you go from the washer to the dryer and you go from the dryer to the folding table. But this folding table is looking at the kids area and the kids area is this big, huge glass enclosure. So how brilliant was that? Let's go to laundromat. I'm going to get my stuff done. The kids can play Mm -hmm. and I don't have to hear them, but I can watch them. Yeah. And then if you not a big, if you're done with kids and you don't have kids and you don't want to go to the pool with all the kids are, and you don't want to go to the laundromat where all the kids are, you can still go to this laundromat because all the kids are in enclosure yeah. playing and you can't hear them. <laughs> so they've invested in a heavily competitive area Smart. with the kids interest and the parents interest at the same time. So that's where I say invest in, uh, uh, the competition and doing what your competition is doing and doing it better than they're doing it. Um, so that that's it. Mm, I think that's awesome. I think it's a uh, thing, man. I mean, that's a pretty cool. Is that that laundromat? Is that in Southern California? Yeah, it's, it's actually in Santa Maria. Oh, it's, it's, dude. it's an eyepiece. Yeah. That's I've pretty. Had some, uh, I've had a bunch of posts on that over the last year on uh, the whole laundromat mic thing. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I mean, I really like that idea. And, you know, I, you know, obviously like McDonald's or whatever, they've really thrived, you know, be partly because of that model that they have. Um, and it's tough to do with a laundromat cause you got to have space, right? Like that's not technically money-making space. Right. But that's an incentive that, I mean, that's huge. You know, that's to dedicate space like that to a play area uh, where, you know, kids can play, get their energy out. You know, I, 
I feel I've done this before myself. I brought my kids, you know, when I had to go to the laundromat, maybe I was cleaning up or whatever, you know, I had to bring my kids along and they're trying to entertain themselves. So they're climbing on stuff or messing with the carts or whatever, you know, and people are doing this, trying to figure out what to do with their kids all the time. And, uh, having something like that is, that's like a, that's like a deal maker. (laughs) <laughs> they're killing it. They're yeah. doing so well because of that. Yeah. Well, I want not because of that, but well, they, 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 yeah, that's gotta be a big part of it. And you know, it takes a certain kind of person to do that, uh, for their laundromat, right? Like they're going to be taking care of their business if they're going to be investing that much money, but also space for yes. something like that. It's, it's, it's pretty neat to, it's the greatest thing about my job is I get to see all of this and it's yeah. fun. And I I'm constantly being educated and, and just when I think I know something, I realize I don't and I learn more. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, the last, last, but definitely not least, uh, one of the consistencies I see in successful laundromat owners, um, they're not afraid to pay the extra buck for the right product or the right service. I'm talking, um, the product whether it's equipment, card systems, or any, any, any vendor item that serves the bottom line, um, they're not afraid to pay the extra buck. Um, installers, they pay people to do it the right way. Mm-hmm. They make sure the right people are using the right materials to do the job the right way. Again, the right people. It's funny. It's it's kind of the the vicious cycle of default, which we were, which I was talking about earlier. Like, oh, I'll take you next time you come around. I um, I know multiple owners who have gone through everyone I know who is a installer in Southern California, mm-hmm. and they always go back to the one that ends up being a little bit more pricey who does the best job. Mm-hmm. So winning by default in that area is good. So just find the person, find the support team you need initially up above. Don't, don't step over uh, quarters to pick up nickels. Do your investment. It's long-term, it's depreciable in most circumstances, and uh, you're able to get the right people right off the bat without having the next three or four projects you're pulling your hair out because uh, you wish that you were with a guy who happens to be a little bit more pricey, you know, maybe a little bit more slow, but it works. Um, the same thing for contractors, same thing for contractors, as I said, for installers, um, what installers or contractors are many times installers at the same time. Sometimes they're separated down here in Southern California. Um, and then um, repair services. Uh, Andy was big on repair services. I think mm-hmm. um, the, uh, you pay them right away. You tell them thank you. You respect what they're doing. They have a tough job driving around and working on equipment, and they're inundated many times more than we are. So uh, find that good repair guy. He may cost a little bit extra, but he's going to show up on time. And when you pay him when he leaves, or when you buy him lunch or her lunch when they uh, when they're there. And when you give them a sincere thank you, um, I guarantee you when you call them, Jordan, on Friday at 5 p.m. and they're an hour away um, and you actually need them, like need them, need them, they're going to be there a lot sooner than if you didn't pay them on time and say thank you and and buy them lunch every once in a while. It just makes sense. So um, building a support team is another consistency. These, These owners find the right people to do the right job. They typically pay more for the job to get done. Um, and somehow um, that just makes them part of, that's just another one of the things that I see consistent within owners. Yeah. I, you know, invest in the people that are investing, you know, in your business with you, you know, like the repair people, the contractors, like invest in them and they're going to take care of you. I love that. Um, okay. Have I want to just had similar experiences with your uh, laundromats. Have you, have you had to go, have you had to win by default? Uh, well, I, yeah, I've, I've struggled, man. (laughs) I mean, and part of it is got your team now. Kind of. So, well, part of it is this, like, this is why I think this, this is like a very good lesson for everybody. Like learn this from me, right? Like I didn't know what I was doing early on. I got involved with, you know, distributors and brokers who weren't looking out for me really. Um, they're looking to make sales and that's fine, whatever, that's their prerogative. Um, but because of that, there's been ripple effects of that for me. Right. So the people that I, 
connect with to help me, you know, do installs. I've had really great people. I have an installer who installed some equipment a few years ago, who still owes me 1500 bucks. Um, I don't think I'm ever going to see that money, but I text him every, you know, couple months, like, Hey, is that money coming? And I always get a new excuse, but and he's a great guy, but you know, so, and, and same with repair people, you know, because I have been connected with, uh, you know, early on because I got connected with people who really weren't taking care of me, I kind of just had to fend for myself. Right. So I've had to go through a lot of people to find good people to work with. And I always try to take care of, you know, people, but then, you know, you start to realize, Oh, this person's, you know, probably not the best person out there. You know, there's, he's not really very responsive and he doesn't really show up when he says he's going to show up. And, you know, he's come three times now and actually none of the machines that he's supposed to be fixing are fixed. (laughs) Like what's going on here? And I've already paid him, you know, like, uh, so just a lot of hard (laughs) lessons. Right. But that's part of like that lesson of, you know, if you, if you cut the wrong corners, if you are look, if you're strictly price driven, you know, that whole, you get what you pay for saying is, you know, it's got, it's got truth to it. So hard lessons to learn that have had ripple effects for years for me, really. How many, how many uh, years have you on those five or six now? Yeah. Like six or seven, somewhere in there. I so, remember meeting you shortly after you got them. Yeah. Yeah. I think I got one and then a little over a year later, I got the second one. So, well, uh, real quick, can we, can we blitz through these? I want to just kind of blitz through, you know, the flip side of that. Do you see anything that, that owners who maybe are struggling a little bit more? What do you see anything consistent that they're doing? Yeah. We're not the, doing um, it's it, yeah. It, it's we can elaborate on what people are doing good. Um, and the consistency there, that's important. Um, some things that I see that people lack on that affects their business is they, they forget about customer service. We're a customer service industry. It's a business. Um, they'll cut the rock wrong corners, um, uh, which is the opposite of what we talked about is doing things the right way, not cutting the wrong corners. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it requires time. Remember the biggest gift you can give someone is your time, as we said earlier on. So give your investment, which is your laundromat, give it some time. It, it, it'll reflect in your um, profits. Um, a laundromat is not a check-in once or twice a week and collect a bunch of quarters. It's just not, it's a business. It needs TLC. It needs to be thought out. It needs to be driven and people need to be thanked. Um, and you know, a lot of times people don't build the laundromat according to the community that it's in. So know your community, know what the community wants. Um, don't get into the laundromat that, uh, you've been thinking about for the last 20 years and you finally get your laundromat and you build it what you were thinking about, but you forgot about the community you built it in. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times people just don't understand the, the lease they got themselves into. Um, but that's what I would say. That's what I would say would be some of the things that um, the don't do's. I would say. Well, yeah, I, I think those are. That's a great list right there. But I want to kind of jump on a tangent a little bit. I mean, a very relevant tangent. But let's please. Let's talk, well, look, I want to talk about the I'm lease. I'm getting hoarse over okay. here. <laughs> no, I mean the the lease is a huge thing, right? It's like going to be your number one or number two expense probably. Uh, you know, f- behind labor perhaps, or maybe in front of labor. Um, so it, that lease is a super important document. So, I mean, can you talk just a little bit more about maybe some things to look out for in a lease or maybe mistakes that you've seen people make? I would say before signing the lease and, and Jordan, you have, you have more experience on this side than I do. This is um, a, a place that I'm, I've gotten into over the last year, year and a half. So please, um, if I say anything that you disagree with, be like, stop, stop right there, <laughs> yeah. stop right there. <laughs> uh, but you definitely have more experience in this than I do. But um, some of the things that I, I do see is people don't um, record check. They don't do the utility comparisons and they don't observe as much as they should be mm-hmm. um, during due diligence. I'm, I'm talking to reference to due diligence uh, before they sign the lease. They just mm-hmm. automatically assume they're going to walk into this lease. The guy's been making money for 20 years and they're going to start to make money too. Um, so once again, that's record checking, utility comparison and observation. And remember that observation 
That's the one area where people can actually cheat on you. So observation is good, but remember that's the one that people can be a little bit shifty on. They can make you see what they don't want you to see. Um, speaking of Andy Cunningham, um, he always says, numbers don't lie, people do. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard it 20 or 30 times. <laughs> And he's right. And and people can manipulate numbers. But is that still lying? Possibly. You mean manipulate numbers to make them say what you want them to. So um, so it, it's really important to record check and do your utility comparisons. You want to see are, are the revenues credible and can they be validated? Are there are the expenses credible and can they be validated? Um, it, is the labor credible? You know, if it's. 3,500 square foot and they're spending $2,000 a month for labor or even 1,000 I've seen and they're saying they're fully attended. Okay, well, so-and-so's niece and cousin cover it most of the time. Are their niece and cousin going to work for it for free when you take it over? <laughs> like, you've got to have that consideration. Where is how is, the, how is the labor allocated from the number that's on your information sheet? Um, and then most importantly, is what's currently here all sustainable throughout the life of the lease? Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing right there. Is it sustainable? And then if it's not, maybe it's good for five, seven, eight years. And then you get into these options that are just insane. And then you're trying to sell a laundromat that's eight years old and you've got these crazy increases and uh, your, your profitable laundromat for the first five years is now a thorn in your side. So uh, you've got to... You got, got to know if it's sustainable um, and you got, you got to understand the lease itself. And this is something that I see quite often. Many people don't understand their lease. Well, you know why? Because I don't like reading 25 pages of print that good. If you had a lease and, and a picture book, I think I would get it. <laughs> <laughs> That's Nobody likes to I read. I really like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. We should start doing Ikea, picture book leases. Ikea lease. <laughs> right. You don't right? have to even speak the language. Be great. So many people, many times people don't understand their terms. They don't understand their rent increases. How does it schedule out over the course of the next 15 years? Um, is it assignable? Mm -hmm. If I have a 20 year lease, can I reassign it? Let me give you um, a quick little thing that I've ran into um, about people who are in the business too. And this goes for everyone, not just newer people. Um, there's, there's people who have multiple stores been in the business for time who get a lease that they end up scratching their heads going, does it really say that? You know, uh, current situation. I wouldn't say current situation. I ran into a recent situation and um these owners had 14 years left on their lease and they were going to do some stuff to make a long story short. They were going to do some stuff, transfer it around, sell that to get something else. And then we go to read the lease and it's four years left on the lease with two five-year options. How many years you got? We got 14 years, right? Not unless after the term lease, after the term lease, you're not able, after that ends, the options are only assignable to the original lessee and they're the second tenant. So what that says is, okay, you've got four years and if the landlord wants to give you the next 10, they could. Now the original lessee, if they have that and they were still in the building, it's automatically warranted to them because that was under the master lease. Mm -hmm. So stuff like that. Um, and yeah, that, that's a big deal too, right? Because they really only have a four-year lease and the landlord could double the rent or decide they don't want a laundromat there anymore. And all of a sudden they don't have a laundromat there anymore, right? Or they're not making nearly as much money as they were. So and these big owners deal. invested, they invested. It wasn't like they just took over and it's standing. They, they, it's, they're killing it. And is the landlord going to work with them? Probably. Probably. Does he have to? Mm -mm. Does he have to? No, no, no. no. Right. And he can, he can gouge them too, you know, especially if they're killing it and he knows it. Right. Right. Oh yeah. We'll give you a new lease. We got a new, forget about the options. We're going to get you a new lease and it starts out three times as much as you're paying right mm -hmm. now. 
Yep. Comps in the area have gone up. It's a beautiful area. Things have changed, you know. It's, so it's uh you want to you want to know the lease. The assignability is 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 huge. Um uh and then here's another story, you know. Um here you, you can reflect on this. Um is a laundromat that you can personally is is it a laundromat that you can personally be successful at? It's kind of like when I was talking to my CPA, I'm like, look, Shaq. I'm not going to just throw you into any laundromat. I'm going to mm-hmm. consider your life balance, what you got going on. And I'm going to make sure you can be successful in that laundromat uh, for a couple of reasons. Why? Because it's common decency for a human being. It's truthful and it's transparent. Mm-hmm. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and number two is I don't want to see you fail. Yeah. I, I, I don't. Um, what do you feel? I don't know. It depends on where to put them into. You know, if I put them into a, a 7,000 square foot laundry store, that's, that's that's killing it and he has a job and a family and everything like that he's probably not going to be that successful um so got to put the right person in the right seat let's say um and then you know get a professional to review it um find a good broker that you trust just like your distributor brokers aren't crooks everyone's always like the stigma of a broker i can go do the whole thing well you know he charges a lot i don't want to pay for it you know how many times i've seen someone lose their ass because they didn't get someone a professional involved in their decision to get a 20-year lease um Mm -hmm. we could do a class on that jordan i mean you could do do a class on that i'm learning about that stuff right now (laughs) but I, i i've seen a lot of it yeah so so yeah that makes sense yeah yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so a good broker or a good consultant can save your butt. And it's, you know, you can you can go to brokers and get consultant have, or you can go to a consultant, spend three grand. Um, and I would love to spend three grand um, for a guy to get me out of a deal that I thought I was going to get myself into to five, seven, 10 years down the road, realize that I just lost a couple hundred grand. Um so that is yeah. not an exaggeration of a story either, because I, I mean, I've said this before on the podcast is, I mean, that was my situation. Like if I could pay, if I could go back and pay somebody 10 grand, a consultant, 10 grand to talk me out of buying that first laundromat, it would have saved me so much money and emotional stress in those early years at this laundromat, you know, that I would, I would go back and do it in a heartbeat, <laughs> but you know, I, I mean, I didn't know better. Right. So, and it, like you said, like this is all part of my story and part of why I do probably a big driving factor of why I do what I do now. Um, but man, getting the right people on your side, huge. Love that. Love that message. Again, build your team. And I'm glad that that happened to you because uh, you wouldn't be helping. We would not have this platform right now if it didn't happen to you. Don't take that personally. I'm glad it happened to you. <laughs> glad it happened to you. Yeah. Thank you. Rejoice in my pain. I love it. Well, listen, this has been incredible. And I mean, you just dropped so much knowledge and I love just your perspective. And this is, I mean, this is stuff I've already known about you. We're good friends. And it's why that, you know, when, when we started talking about getting together, putting together a a syndication group, diligence, capital investments, you know, and, and you kind of asked if, if I was interested in being a part of what you're doing and, you know, all all that, like I on board 100% right away. Not only are you uh, just an awesome guy, you know, and an awesome dad and, you know, and all that, but you're super knowledgeable and you joke all the time with Ross and I about, you know, Oh, you guys let me join blah, 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 blah. But you know, when we went and checked out this last, uh, this last project, we're thinking about jumping into, um, which is a, a build out of a, of a retail space, um, for a laundromat. And I saw you in action. I was like, this is your element. Like this is your, like this is your wheelhouse right here. And you just went right to work and the wheels were turning. You knew exactly what to do, exactly what to look for, exactly what we needed to be successful in that spot. And I could not be happier to have you on part of diligence. So let's talk about that just for a second. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, I do. Thank you. Uh, you get, I, got, I think I just teared up there, Jordan. <laughs> well, hey, I, seriously, I mean, I know we like joking back and forth, but I, I mean every word of that. Like you... No, seriously, I did tear up. Yeah. <laughs> 
all right, quit being a crybaby over there. And uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'm just, I'm super pumped to be, you know, partnering with you and with Ross. And I think it's a, it's a special thing we got going and I'm excited about not just, uh, you know, making some money with, you know, laundromats and real estates. Cause I think we're going to do that. Right. And, and we're going to partner with people and, you know, they're going to make money too, but even more than that, for one, it's the way that I know that we're going to do it because I know who you are. I know who Ross is. I know who I am. And the way that we're going to do it means something to me. And, um, you know, coming with integrity and, you know, that, that servant's heart, like I know that you have and that Ross has, um, all of that. And, um, and not only that, but I, I, I'm excited about doing good things for the communities we're going to be involved in, which I think is one of the beauties of this industry, right? Like Elizabeth Brick and, Brick and Wilson came on the podcast a little while ago. And I've said this quote a few times now that she said, but she said, you know, your laundromat is really an extension of the community's home, right? Because it's a home chore, right? Laundry is a home chore. And um, I love that people like you and like Ross and, you know, and me get to get together and, you know, make that happen in, in some community. So I'm excited about that. You said servant's heart and there's, you know, when we tried this and I was the third to come on by the way. So I, I was <laughs> humbled that you guys invited me with your experience and with you guys are, are, are doing, but how you got in the business and what you're doing uh, for on this platform is amazing. And then Ross is, I mean, i that guy is all about giving back to the community. Yeah. Um, his heart is in the right place. Um, I'm sure you've seen his video. Um, have you seen the video that I've he's done? I've seen it and it's awesome. And I will link to it so other people can watch it too. Cause it's, so we don't even have to talk cool. about Ross. We'll just let everybody watch the video. And that video does a lot better job than you and I can ever possibly talk about uh, that guy. And I uh, honestly, I, like I see a lot of people are out there. He is one of the most effective owners that I've come across in Southern California. Yeah. I have a lot of respect for him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Definitely a top operator. And yeah, I, I love it. Well, it just, you know, just to throw it out there, if that's something that you're interested in doing, if you're interested in, in, you know, being a part of one of these syndications, the best, best way to hear a little bit more information is go to diligencecapitalinvestments.com. Um, and I'll link to that also. So you can check that out. And, uh, if, uh, if you're interested in that, there's a little form on there. You can just drop your name and email address. We're not spamming anybody, but the, basically the way that we, uh, the way that we function is that we're going out looking for, um, laundromat deals to either buy or to make, um, and, or, uh, commercial real estate deals. And, and we're really wanting to partner those two together to marry laundromats in real estate together uh, to create a whole lot of value for everybody involved. So if that's something that you're interested in, go drop your name and email address on the form there. Um, and when we have deals that um, we are interested in investing in, basically what we'll do is we'll put together a package with just a bunch of information about a particular deal. Um, you know, what, what the plan is for that deal, what it's going to look like, uh, when it's done and what investment opportunities in that deal, uh, there will be, um, and the parameters around that. And we'll, you know, we'll send that information, that package out to, uh, that investor list. So I know a lot of you guys are already signed up. It's been pretty cool. And we're really excited to, to partner with you guys. And we would love to, um, you know, to also use this as an opportunity to educate people, you know, about the industry. So if you're looking for a relatively passive way to get in that you can start to learn this business and you want to learn from the best and by the best, I mean, Ross and Michael, and I'll be there to uh, learn in with you guys and, you know, maybe offering a little here and there, but um, this, this could be a really great way for, you know, the right kind of person and going back to, to Michael's, you know, point is, you know, this is for the right kind of, this is not for everybody, right? This is for the right kind of person, maybe somebody who already has some money that they want to put to work for them and either wants to do it passively or wants to do it in a way where they can learn the business. We, you know, we'll be, we'll be open with our investors and we'll run it very transparent and we'll also be available um, to talk laundromats. So I don't know, you want to add anything to any of that? No, it's uh, you, you, noted it all. And it's, uh, I'm happy to be working with you and Ross on this. 
and and thank you for allowing me to be here today. Yeah, I, I, I've enjoyed the conversation. It's not too often that you could actually sit down and have laundry talk and have the other person actually be interested. And in this case, <laughs> there's there's what three billion people other listening. So yeah, I mean, by the time it comes out, they'll probably we'll probably hit that four billion mark. I'm guessing. Nice, so nice, yeah. nice. <laughs> well, dude, it has been my honor, my privilege, and even though you know we're 46 or so episodes in, and you know desperation drove me to ask you on. I guess it's worked out out pretty well. <laughs> no, but hey. seriously, man, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you on and to hear your wisdom and, and insight into this industry. So I really appreciate you coming on, dude. Well, whatever I brought to the table, I learned from everybody out there. So uh, I'll keep on keep on getting on the streets and learning from all of uh, the owners, uh, new and, and people who have been around for a while and people like yourselves and Ross. So uh, I'm humbled. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we'll be in touch soon. I know that for a fact. Yeah. Go follow Laundromat Mike on Instagram and on Facebook and connect up with him. Great dude. You got to know him. All right, guys. All right. I told you Michael is such a solid guy. So cool. His heart really comes through in that episode. And I loved, loved, love that. Uh, and hopefully you got a chance to just get to know him and just benefit from the immense wisdom that he has. So good. And I also hope that if you're watching on YouTube, you really enjoyed my mustache, which my wife already made me shave off. Uh, lamely, even though it was glorious. And if you are listening on the podcast, you might want to go check it out on YouTube briefly. Check out that glorious mustache because it's, I mean, there's not really another word than glorious. Okay. Anyways, uh, back to Michael because he, uh, dude, he just brought so much good stuff. I really loved uh, hearing from his perspective from the distributor side of things uh, about uh, you know, what makes a good distributor, what distributors should be doing and how to work with a good distributor to benefit you as the owner and benefit them, but mostly you as the owner, um, over the long haul. And I just thought he brought a ton of great wisdom. One of the things you know, I encourage you every single week, take one thing, whatever it is, big or small, take one thing, put it into practice and uh, let's do that every week and see where that takes us because I think it'll take us big places. So for me, I mean, again, there's a ton of stuff in this episode that, uh, I mean, he broke down what he sees you know, successful owners doing, and he broke down what he sees struggling owners doing. So there's a ton of things to do and not do just in that those two sections alone, uh, but really, the one thing that just keeps getting driven home to me is to be value based. Like don't be price based. Yes, price is important and I will always think price is important and I do think that, you know, this is my personal opinion, but I do think that you can negotiate a little bit with these guys and uh, you don't have to necessarily take the first offer and you can get multiple quotes and I think you should get multiple quotes. However, I don't think price is the only factor. And a big reason that I think this is being driven home to me is because I think it's one of the mistakes that I made early on um, where I was mostly just price driven and it was kind of at the expense of having that relationship um, with a good distributor who's going to help me succeed in this business. And I struggled. I mean, you guys, most of you have heard my story already. I struggled so much on the in the early uh, years of owning that first laundromat. And I think if I had somebody on my team who was good, who could say, okay, here's what we need to do. Um, I would have just done it and, and gotten out of that situation a lot quicker. So, uh, value based. And so going forward, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sold on it, but I, it just keeps getting reinforced to me about how important that is. And that theme just keeps coming up over and over. So for me, that's the thing for you. Uh, I would love to hear what that thing is for you. What's the one thing you're putting into action? Go drop it in on the forums. Again, lightning fast over there now, laundromatresource.com slash forums. And uh, go ask a question, answer a question, and drop your one action uh, that you're going to take this week over the forums. All right. Cannot wait to see you next week. Peace.